What nice a pleasure. You. Hello. I took an entertaining ride watching this documentary. Congratulations to both of you. I know it's been a journey. It's quite an unbelievable true story that put me through different emotions. I was actually quite touched um, towards the end of it. Um, Jono, as someone whose foundation is in journalism and you were a classmate of Brandon slash Brian, how did your investigation come about? I know there was the article, but how did it unravel? And were you as shocked as everyone else as you discovered all of these different facts about Brandon's journey? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's been a big gap from the story breaking back in 1995 to, to, to us all making this film. Um, I think when I started off in the process of, 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 of making the film, the very first person I interviewed was Brandon himself. And actually what I came to realise was that so much of our understanding of this story was informed by the fact that the only person who's been telling it all these years was Brandon. You know, he's published multiple memoirs. He's done the rounds of the chat show circuit back in the day and given newspaper interviews and stuff. And everything that we generally came to understand was sort of fed from that. But actually the process of getting my class back together again and saying, well, hang on, actually, what do you remember happening? I came to realise that surprise surprise Brandon's version of events wasn't the most trustworthy <laughs> such an idea. Uh, yeah like I'm, I'm so easily fooled I, would, I could be fooled again today just as I was back in 93. Alan you're stepping into the shoes of of Brandon obviously Sash Brian and and it's a man who's constantly seeking validation right how was it stepping into the shoes of of Brandon and then also to lip sync how do you approach a role like that and um, well, it's 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 unlike anything I'd ever done. You know, I'd never the only t only person I'd ever lip synced before was myself. In you know, in films and things, you have to sometimes when you're singing, for instance, you have to lip sync. And um, so it was really difficult because I've never played a character where I didn't control all the elements. And in a funny way, you know, one element being so dictated. Uh, meant you had to sort of make everything else sort of go on top of it and meld around it. So it was kind of fascinating, but also terrifying. And because uh, there was no precedent or no kind of, uh, no one else to talk to, but like, how do you um, lip sync a real person in a film, in a documentary? Right. Um, and also I had sort of a, such a strong connection to, I mean, this, this is a huge story in Scotland in the early 90s when that happened. And, about, and a few years after it actually happened, I was going to do a film, which is actually mentioned in, the sh in, the, in, the, in our, this film. I was going to direct and be in a film playing Brandon, uh, a drama, 25 years ago. So Jono asking me to do this was not only a, a big challenge technically, but also it was that me going back to a character I was supposed to have played. The film, my, my version of the film fell apart. But I was going back to something that I was going to do a quarter of a century ago. So it was an incredible experience for, you know, the way that things come back to you. And uh, it was really, and I'm, I'm really glad because I think this film is a much better version of the one that I would have made. It's more about, it's more from the point of view of the people who were there. And right. it's about how memory alter so much. And you can have, you can all um, undergo the same experience, but your versions of that in terms of your memory and how your memory changes towards it can differ incredibly. Did you ever have a chance to meet Brandon slash Brian? Brandon? No, I didn't. I mean, I think the time to do it would have been 25 years ago when I was going to, and I probably would have had it gone, had it continued, but I, uh, I didn't because um, I uh, was in New York and mm -hmm. that didn't, uh, wasn't possible. So, but now this time no, I didn't meet him and, uh, because, you know, I think he he didn't want to appear in the film. So I don't imagine he'd be right. <laughs> that keen did to you, meet the person who was actually appearing in. Right. Did you film? How did how did the process go on the levels? You filmed you speaking and then putting in the voice? Or how did that how did that come yeah. about? The, 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 yeah, that would have been a challenge for Alan. Um, the, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the very genesis of the film was Brandon agreeing to an interview. So mm -hmm. that was his, his line in the sand was, 
I am willing to be interviewed. I'm willing to tell my story. He's always been willing to tell his story in various ways. But um, as of present day, he, he just didn't want to be seen on camera for whatever reason. You know, we can we can all make guesses on what that may be. But um, he so I knew that that, that, that was basically the, the starting point that I would have this audio. Now, I look back now and go, why did I not just make a blooming podcast? That would have been much easier. I would have been done four years ago. But um, I knew that there would have been successful lip sync performances in the past. Um, but what I was trying to do was hang an entire film around one actress performance. Yeah. But actually, what better way in a, in a film about going back in time and revisiting your past self? Who better to take on the role than the man who was meant to play Brandon all those exactly. years ago? Exactly. And I love, uh, and I'd love to get both of your takes on this and sort of the creative process, the animation storytelling between that and then the characters of the actual classmates themselves. Uh, my final question is, Alan, were you able to sort of sit with the classmates and talk to them about their stories before they did their interviews? And then if you can talk, Jono, about the um, animation process and creating those characters, Alan, first. I didn't meet the classmates until the party in Glasgow. Like the film premiered at Sundance, but then we had a, it was at the Glasgow Film Festival and there was a party afterwards and I met them all there. And it was incredible because I've seen them over the, you know, the few, last few years in various cuts of the movie. And then to actually meet them all and to see them all interacting with each other, it was sort of like they were back at high school again. It was the same little groups and the, the, the sort of the bully was going around buying people drinks and apologizing and <laughs> uh, yeah it was really it was really incredible so that was that was the first time but I felt like I knew them by the time I actually met them but I hadn't met them before no I bet you were stepping into somebody else's shoes at the the high school reunion per se yeah yeah it was a, the whole thing's been bizarre yeah I bet, I bet. And, and about the animation Jonah yeah, it's a really talented Scottish animation company called Wild Child who did the animation. Um, I was, you know, I basically came to a realization that I was making a film set in the 1990s about um, this guy with a monotone North American accent, big curly hair and glasses who walked into my classroom in the 1990s. He was he was a male version of Daria, the, the, the yes. kind of 90s. Uh, animation icon. So absolutely, we wanted to nod to her. She's so amazing. And, okay, um, I'm not yeah, crazy because the first thing I thought, the first thing I thought was Doria <laughs> in Quinn and all. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? Like uh, very much that was a kind of jumping off point for us. But we took kind of we took uh, uh, steer from other other animations that time, and also uh, you know our film dips back further in time, and, and we looked at things like the Archie Show and Scooby Doo and stuff like that. So um, yeah, no, I and, and I knew that the story was quite complicated, and I wanted a really simple way for the audience to follow what was going on. And, um, and as it turned out, animation was the perfect way to do that, I think. That's great. One more uh, question, really. Oftentimes, once something goes, I know it was film, and then the film didn't happen, and now there's the documentary. Sometimes that goes to Netflix or wherever, and then it becomes a movie. So, Alan, do you think that this will seek another step? Do you think it'll take another step, or do you think this is the right storytelling right here? I think this is the, I mean... The older I get, the, the, I realize that I'm much more, um, I, I enjoy much more documentary. When I go on a plane, I click immediately to the documentary section. I, I, I don't know, this maybe because I, that's my job is to do sort of reenactments, drama reenactments of things. I don't know, I'm just much more interested in real life and, and the people who experience something telling their version of that story. That to me is much more interesting as a viewer. Uh, you know, like I, I, uh, I, I, like I say, I, I said earlier, I don't often always watch, you know, some, a lot of the things that I'm in, I probably would watch them where I'm not in them. Uh, but because I, I actually like um, stories that are told by the people who they happen to. So I think this is the, I mean, maybe this will go on. Maybe it will be, maybe I'll get caught up in 25 more years by some young filmmaker say, hey, I'm making the life story. <laughs> you'll be you'll curious, Jonna. You'll come, come back and play them in a different form. Who knows in the metaverse? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you uh, both so much and congratulations. Really, it was it was really one of the most entertaining documentaries I've ever seen. So thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, so Pamela. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.